Hi, everyone. Thanks for being here with us this evening. Uh, my name is Becky Levin, and I'm going to be moderating tonight on behalf of the Steering Committee of Northside Democracy for America, or NDFA. NDFA is a grassroots political organization that's dedicated to electing socially progressive, fiscally responsible, and ethically committed Democrats to all levels of government. We would encourage you to like us on Facebook if you haven't already. Um, so we're going to be sharing a link uh, at the bottom of your screen for our virtual tip jar. Uh, we would love it if you can support us. I'd also like to thank uh, my fellow steering committee members, EJ, Kevin, Mary Claire, Mary Melissa, Ray, and especially Joe Federico, who is backstage basically making sure this whole thing runs. Because while I will be asking the questions and doing the moderating, that technology is largely beyond me. So really excited to be hosting the first of two candidate forums for the newly created role of police district council. Um, as a lot of you probably know, last year the city passed the ECPS, Empowering Communities for Public Safety Ordinance. Um, it's really the first ordinance of its kind in the nation for civilian oversight of police. Uh, so very excited about this, uh, but there's a lot of work to do to make sure that this happens. The ECPS ordinance created essentially uh, two a uh, two-tiered structure. Uh, there's a citywide community commission for public safety and accountability. The interim commission is seven members. It was appointed uh, several months ago by the mayor. Um, and it creates a structure of police district councils uh, to serve as a connection between local residents and police. Um, and those folks on the district councils will nominate the citywide commission uh, to find out what police district you're in. We have the link scrolling across the bottom here. Um, because in each of the 22 districts in the city, three people will be elected to the district council. So that's a lot of new elected officials, which is great for democracy, but we also need to make sure that voters are aware of this new structure and that they're voting for candidates who are committed to accountability and transparency. So that's why we're hosting these, these forums. Um, so this evening, we're going to hear from nine candidates um, across four different Northside police districts. Um, all of the candidates who we're hearing from filled out a brief questionnaire to make sure that they're aligned with those values of um, transparency and accountability and reform. Each candidate is going to have 10 minutes uh, to speak. They're going to give a two minute introduction, uh, followed by seven minutes of question and answer and a one minute closing. Um, we're going to keep really tight with the time. Um, so if they don't get to fully finish a thought, um, please don't hold it against them. Give them grace. I have been where they are as a candidate and it is a pretty daunting task. We want to get through as much information as possible. So if I cut them off, um, just uh, go with the flow. Um, and we also really encourage you to submit questions uh, via Facebook. Facebook. Um, I will take the liberty where necessary of combining questions or making sure that they're um, streamlined a bit if necessary. Um, we will, at the beginning of each candidate, be sharing their website or social media if we have that information. So we'll be able to find more information about them later. And for NDFA voting members, you will get an electronic ballot um, after we've finished uh, this evening's forum and Thursday's forum sometime uh, within the next uh, few days after that, say sometime before Christmas, uh, you will get an electronic ballot to use to vote on endorsements. Um, and so we're going to get started on our uh, first candidate. So first up, we are going to hear from candidates in the 19th district. Um, so 19th district, all of these districts are on the north side. The 19th district runs from Fullerton on the south end to Lawrence on the north side and roughly from the lake to the river. Um, so it's a very large district. Um, there are six candidates who filed to run for police district council in the 19th district, and we are going to hear from five of them this evening. Full disclosure, I live in the 19th district and I know all of them. Um, and I think you're gonna enjoy hearing from them. So first up we have Jenny Schaefer. 
Hi, thank you so much for having me. Um, should I just start by talking about myself right now? Absolutely, okay. yeah. Excellent. Um, so I am a mom of three kids. I live in the North Center neighborhood. All three of my kids go to CPS schools. Um, I started my career as a special ed teacher for many, many years. Really um, understand the importance of advocacy as a special education teacher. I had to make sure that my students needs were met um, and that they were fully included to, in the school and seen as a valuable part of that community. After um, I taught, I was very involved with an organization called Embark, which um, gives students from underserved neighborhoods, it, it, give, it takes them out of their community and, and introduces them to more of what Chicago has to offer. Through that experience, I formed close relationships with these students who I was seeing what their um, what experiences they had in their lives and comparing it to the experiences that my own kids were having. And it became very clear to me what was important for success in, uh, for a person. And it wasn't that my kids were inherently you know, smarter or less safe than anyone, it's that my kids had access to the basic things that they needed. Whereas the Embark students I was working with, you know, were going to schools where there were more security workers and social workers where you know, they were living next to abandoned lots and deteriorated houses. And it really became clear that, that if we wanna create changes in Chicago, we need to make sure that we're investing in communities. Started doing a lot of work, um, investing in underserved communities, and then also realized that not only um, do, I, you, do we, we there, there's lots of work to do right here in my own community. So I became very involved in um, starting my school, my kids' schools, an anti-racism group there um, so that parents could act and I um, the temple that I that I belong to I joined the social justice group there where we work to um, pass the CPS ordinance and now that it's passed we are here and excited to be be uh, on the ballot to represent uh, the 19th district great Thanks. Um, so the district councils were designed so that each counselor takes the lead on one primary function, the chair, um, fostering connections with the community and nominating the citywide commission. Um, which role most interests you and how do you plan to carry it out? I think fostering, communicate, um, fostering the connections with the community is something that's always been really important to me. That's something I do currently right in my role at Coonley as anti-racism um, leader, but also just something that we've been doing with our slate right now. I, we've talked to different organizations within the community um, like Threshold, Ready, and other organizations who are really thinking progressively about alternative um, solutions to, or what else we could do to add to our public safety system. Public safety system. And for me, building connections is, is huge. And additionally to the connections that I've built through the um, nonprofits that we've talked to. We've also been building lots of connections with people in, our, in um, the community. Our slate together with Marilio Garcia and Sam Schoenberg, we've had over 100 volunteers help us out um, throughout this whole process. So building community is something that's been really important to me and something that I continue to want to do once I become district council. Great. So. Um Beyond the campaign, what approach do you plan to use to facilitate communication between community members and police? I think that you just need to really be open and willing to listen and meet people where they're at. I think right now we need to be able to have conversation where we hear people who have different ideas, listen to them respectfully, and then be able to come to an agreement on what can be done. I think our platform um, is really one that is, that brings people together because I think not only um, will the things that we're proposing be better for the community, but they'll also be better for police, police workers as well. Um, so I think that naturally our, the, what the, our platforms that we're suggesting will be best for everyone and people will come together for that. We've already been seeing that with all the outreach we've been doing. Great. And you mentioned a few organizations you've already been in touch with. Are there particular populations that you plan to prioritize when it comes to community voice? For sure. Um, w working with underserved communities is, is definitely very important to our slate. We know that our, that 
our safety is is reliant on the most vulnerable among us. We are not safe until the most vulnerable populations are safe. So committing to their safety, we are very aligned um, and have been endorsed by One People's Campaign. Um, they work a lot in Uptown and serve many underserved um, communities. So having that alliance will help us reach out to them, but also making sure we're out in the community, talking to people, listening to them, knocking on, we've knocked on doors throughout all 19, um, all the wards that the Ninth State District touches. So that's very important to us. Terrific. Um, so the 19th district is the largest in terms of population, and it is one of the most diverse districts. Uh, so how does that affect your approach to representing the community? Well, I think we need to make sure that we're listening. You know, I come from, I'm a white woman. I come from privilege. I need, we need to make sure that we are listening carefully to what people are saying and using, um, using really uplifting their voices. Uh, we want to make sure that the organizations that are representing them, representing them are also part of our team and are, we're able to um, uplift what they're saying as well so that we can spread those messages to the rest of the community. Thanks. So what does community safety mean to you? Um, I love that question. I, public say, I think that's really at the heart of what I want to do with this position is really expand what public safety means to everyone in this community. I think we are so, so many people are so focused on public safety being only policing. And to me, public safety is much more expansive than that and really has to be if we're gonna create safe communities for all people. I think that we need to make sure that we have mental health care workers who are responding to mental health care um, calls in the, in the neighborhood. I think we need to make sure that we, we have appropriate responses to drug related calls and to homelessness and to really be thoughtful um, about what public safety is and to make sure that everyone sees themselves as an important stakeholder in creating a uh, safe community. Great, thank you. Um, and last question, can you just describe a little bit more in detail what made you interested in running for district council? Yeah, I think I have a very clear vision for what a what an elevated public safety system could look like. I think with my background and talking to people about um, new ideas and, and being able to um, work to shape conversation amongst amongst people who maybe have, you know, um, less progressive ideas and being able to push them forward and help them rethink what, what public safety could be is something that's really, really important to me. And one of the reasons why I'm really excited to be running for this position. Um, yeah. Yeah, so how do, how do you think you would go about that, getting folks to, to rethink and um, think outside the box about what public safety could be? I sitting down and having conversation. I mean, I think we, I, and also, I, and also hearing from the nonprofits that we've been talking to who have all these amazing ideas. Um, I think, we're, and not only have the ideas, but have the research to prove that their ideas are effective and that they're working to create safer communities. I think that is something that we are really, um, that is really important to make sure their voices are part of, of the discussion and what, what creating a public safety system could look like. Great, thanks. Uh, so now you have a minute to close and say anything you didn't get a chance to or sum up. Yeah, well, I think, so the, I'll close by saying I am on a slate with Marilu Garcia and Sam Schoenberg. And I think the exciting thing about us running together as a slate is that our values are really aligned. And once we get elected, we can really begin immediately hitting the ground running with ideas and getting these things started in, um, in the 19th district, we know that that these are, this is a brand new position, and we really want to see this move forward in a way that's productive and and then and in alignment with what the people who passed the ordinance wanted to see um, happen with the district council level. So we feel really excited to be together and to be able to do this uh, um, to represent the community in this way. Great. Thank you so much, Jenny. I really appreciate you taking the time this evening. And I'll just remind people. Thank for you. The, yeah, just a reminder to everyone, please feel free to submit comments in the 
the chat. Well, I am happy to uh, keep asking questions. Uh, this is really your forum, uh, not just mine. Um, so next up is Marilio Garcia. Hey, Becky. Hi. Uh, so you get two minutes to open. Awesome. Yeah. So thank you so much for uh, having me, Becky, and to the entire NDFA team for having us tonight. Uh, my name is Maurilio Garcia. Uh, can also be pronounced Marilio, whichever one you could pronounce. Um, I grew up in Houston, Texas, and I attended Northwestern. So I moved to the Chicagoland area about 17 years ago uh, to attend college in Northwestern. I've been living in Uptown, which is in the 46th Ward, uh, for about four and a half years now. Um, I moved in with my partner. We were first-time homeowners. Literally about two weeks after we moved in, uh, there was a drive-by shooting down our block, uh, literally the half a block away. Uh, it wasn't the last time that it happened. It was really jarring. It was really scary. Uh, so I started getting involved in terms of meeting with uh, my alderman, attending CAPS meeting, understanding what was happening in my neighborhood, seeing what we can do as a community uh, to address the issue. Uh, unfortunately, I was frustrated and disheartened by the resources and the community input that was available to address these issues. And it seemed to me that there could be something more out there that we could do as a community. Um, one of the things that I've really loved uh, about my profession is that as a market research and brand strategist, brand strategist, what I do for um, a living is solicit the opinions of mass audiences through online surveys and focus groups and taking those uh, opinions, distilling them into data-backed action plans. And I've gotten the opportunity to work in a pro bono capacity at my employer uh, with Chicago nonprofit organizations um, to help the community. And that's been really fulfilling. So I've had this experience at the community level, uh, taking my skill set. And so when I heard about the uh, district council position, I was really excited because I felt like I could use the skill set that I've honed in for the last 10 years at my employment and really translate that to a community focus endeavor uh, using data uh, and soliciting opinions of our community at the local level to see what we can do to make our, our communities safer. Um, and for me, one of the most exciting things about that is that from a data perspective, we can make sure that uh, any voice of marginalized communities is elevated, amplified, so that we make sure that they don't go unnoticed or ignored. So to me, that's extremely important because being from the 46th Ward, it is the most diverse in the 19th District. And I want to make sure that we are he hearing everyone's voices so that we can make the 19th District a safer community for all residents. Great, thanks. Um, so can you talk a little bit about what um, particular populations or organizations you might prioritize when it comes to hearing those community voices and how you might go about that? Yeah, when we talk about public safety and policing, it's really important to think about um, people of color, uh, black and brown uh, Americans and citizens, uh, but also the LGBTQ plus community as well, including trans women uh, that are in our neighborhood. We wanna make sure that anything that is going to be put forth is going to work for all of us, not just a select few. So it's really important for me to elevate those voices, those experiences, because we know for a fact that uh, systemically, uh, we have systems that work against us. And so to me, it's extremely important that we amplify and elevate the voices and those experiences so that we can make sure that everyone understands what it might look like if you are a person of color or you are part of the LGBTQ plus community. Um, so that, you know, we all, as residents of the 19th District, understand how one initiative might work for one person, but it might actually work counter to another. And that, to me, is extremely important because we want to make sure, like I said, that the 19th District is safe for everyone. Yeah, so can you talk a little bit more about how you might build those bridges and, and um, how uh, in, a, in a community that is so diverse, that has such different interests, um, how you might craft that, that unified uh, approach. Yeah, um, and, and you might have heard Jenny talk about relationship building, but it's all about relationship building. And the, the benefit about um, the being in the 19th district and, and uh, in, across the city of Chicago, there's so many great organizations out there uh, that have the expertise and the knowledge and the research uh, you know, we've been speaking with uh, organizations like AMF uh, that, you know, is really focusing on protecting and uh, amplifying the Asian community. Organizations like that, that we could build relationships, understand what their experiences and their research based uh, initiatives are looking like and integrating those into our work. And one of the things that, that we think about in terms of relationship building is that we as district council members could be the hub of information and knowledge and advocates for programs like AMF. 
uh, that can really help uh, elevate some of those ideas that will enroll some of the marginalized communities in our district. Um, and so working with more organizations like that, making sure that everybody in the district is aware of them and um, we can just you know, pursue the initiatives that they're pursuing and put them in front of our community so that we can uh, enact some of the changes, progressive changes that we want to see. Great, thank you. And yeah. what approaches do you plan to use to facilitate communication between those community residents and the police? Yeah, so right now we have, you know, uh, community conversations uh, that are led by the police district. And I've attended a couple of those and it seems that um, it's a one-sided conversation. You know, as district counselors right now, what is asked us, of us is to have a once a month meeting. Uh, we think there is gonna need to be many more meetings uh, just because we are so large, we touch diff six different wards, right? And there's gonna be different um, needs across those wards. So some of the ways that we wanna start having uh, conversations is, um, local conversations by the ward level uh, and making sure that we address each of the ne wards needs uh, because the 43rd wards needs might be different from the 46th, right? Um, so we wanna make sure that we're having those in-person conversations. Uh, another thing that I mentioned is that I work in market research, which means I, I create surveys online uh, to poll and survey folks on whatever issues might be at hand. I think we can translate these skill sets of mine uh, to build an infrastructure electronically uh, and virtually so that we could pull folks on any issues, uh, any policies that may be uh, being uh, put forth, uh, and also soliciting just, you know, open-end opinions, just saying, what are you worried about? What are you thinking about in terms of, you know, public safety and policing needs in our community? And then having that as a start to our conversations. I'm never going to say that data is the end-all, be-all solution, but it's a great way to really start the conversation and have a temperature check of where our community uh, is thinking in terms of any initiative or policy. Uh, in addition, you know, with a data-backed approach, we can, uh, as we say in the industry, we can cut the data a number of different ways. So when I talk about marginalized communities, understanding that, you know, the 46th ward is different, more diverse, and understanding, you know, if people are willing to provide their demographic information, uh, looking at the demographic information and using that to make sure that we amplify those experiences. Uh, because like as I said before, those of, uh, you know, those people of color in the, in the, district and of the LGBTQ community are going to have different experiences and needs when it comes to policing and public safety. So we have an opportunity to look, isolate those opinions and perspectives uh, and make sure that we address those needs first and foremost. Great, thank you. Um, and thinking about the three primary functions of the district council, the, the chairperson, mm -hmm. that conduit to community and the nomination of the yeah. citywide commission, uh, what do you most gravitate towards and how do you plan to carry that out? Yeah, that's a great question. You know, one of the great things about working as a slate right now is that we kind of have fallen into our strengths. And one of the things for me, I think, is uh, being a, a people oriented person where I have communication and engagement with those in our neighbors and having conversations. So I think it's uh, much more to the people side, having conversations. As I mentioned, my skill set is in uh, market research, so I want to translate those skills yet again. So it's really about understanding perspectives, opinions, experiences, uh, and then working with, uh, you know, my uh, co-candidates, Sam and Jenny, to make sure that we are going to nominate uh, commission members that are going to really carry forth our values. A question, because it was a popular one last time. What sure. does community safety mean to you? Yeah, community safety is great. Um, uh, it's a great question, I should say. Um, you know, you have to take community at the forefront of safety because as as a community, there's so many different legs. You know, there are there's the government leg, but there are also like the businesses within our community, the residents within our community, the organizations and the nonprofits within our community. It's going to take a group effort. So for me, what community safety means is an entire group effort where everybody is working together to make sure that all of our residents are feeling safe and heard. Um, and that's one of the most exciting things about it uh, for me is just making sure that we take a holistic approach because right now public safety too often means policing to a lot of people. And we think that it's much more than just policing. It's a huge umbrella that is going to, you know, uh, include things like mental health professionals, uh, homelessness response teams, homelessness re uh, response initiatives. So it's really a holistic approach. And that's what community means, right? It's everyone. Uh, and so for me, it's really about just taking a holistic approach and expanding what public safety means uh, to, to us and the residents of 19th District. Great. Thank you. And one minute to close. 
Yeah, so one of the things I mentioned is relationship building. You know, uh, it's at the forefront of our campaign. We've had over 100 volunteers uh, get petition signatures for us. Uh, we got over 3,500 signatures. We are really feeling that relationship building first and foremost right now as our campaign is starting. We're also working with organizations within the city that are professionals and have uh, expertise in mental health services and uh, uh, violence interruption programs. We really think that relationship building is at the forefront of our um, our campaign, and we've already shown that working together, the three of us, we're the only slate in the 19th district. We have that working relationship already. We're ready to hit the ground running from day one, and we've already gotten, you know, uh, relationships built with uh, Alderman Matt Martin, Alderman Andre Vasquez. We've gotten their endorsement, and we're working closely with their teams, and we we're looking to do the same with the rest of the wards in the district. And so, you know, we've already got the the runway there, uh, and we're looking forward to keeping the the work going, and and we're ready for it. We're excited. Great, thank you. I really appreciated hearing from you, Marilio. Uh, Thanks, my Spanish pronunciation me. is terrible, so I won't <laughs> even try to say it any other no, no way. I appreciate uh, that. And next up uh, from the 19th district is Sam Schoenberg. Hi, Hi Sam. Becky, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Uh, I'm two good. minutes for an introduction. Sure, and thank you so much to you and uh, Northside DFA for hosting us tonight. Um, and, honored for the opportunity to apply for your endorsement. Um, so my name is Sam Schoenberg. I grew up in Springfield, Illinois, which many of our listeners may have visited on an eighth grade field trip. Uh, but I got my start at advocacy in Springfield when I was a senior in high school. Uh, that was 2007 and uh, US Senator Barack Obama announced his candidacy for president that year. And I volunteered that day. Um, I spent much of the next two years uh, from the Iowa caucuses through taking some time off of college to um, organized full-time in the Virginia general election, uh, focused on that campaign and seeing really the power of political campaigns to bring people together for a cause greater than themselves. Um, and it was just, it was a deeply formative experience for me and one that I've been so excited to tap into again during this campaign for district council along with my co-candidates. Um, you know, fast, fasting forward a little bit uh, after the campaign, I graduated from college. I um, continued organizing for a couple of nonprofits, helping to get corporate money out of politics. It's a long, long road to hope there, uh, but also helping to expand access to the health insurance under the Affordable Care Act. And then I went to law school and um, I started law school the same month that Michael Brown was killed in Ferguson, Missouri by a police officer. Um, there were nationwide calls for police reform and an end to mass incarceration. And I spent a lot of my time in law school trying to understand just exactly how the criminal legal system leads to injustice for so many people, particularly for black and brown people in America. And one of my big takeaways from that is that policing is one of our least democratic institutions. There are very few public inputs into how police do their job. We kind of wait for things to go wrong and then try to regulate on the back end with court cases. And I think we could just do a much better job on the front end of, of uh, spelling out how police should um, operate in our communities. And when I moved to Chicago, I found a whole community who was trying to do just that. There was the coalition that finally came together uh, to pass the Empowering Communities for Public Safety Ordinance. I joined the grassroots effort as a volunteer to get that passed. And um, I'm so excited that it's been passed. And now I really wanna make sure that these district councils get off to a strong start. And that's why I'm running for this. Since you are an attorney, why don't we start out with a comment that, or a question that came in from Facebook? I think we're gonna pop it up on the screen. The question sure. from Melissa. So how much power are the police district councils going to have to set policy? Yeah, I think it's a great question. And this is brand new. Uh, this is a brand new position. It's never existed before. Becky, as you said at the top of the hour here, um, there's really no precedent for this anywhere in the country. And so what I'm really excited about is the opportunity of, of district councils to nominate members of the citywide community commission for public safety that will have final say over police policy. And when I talk about setting the rules for how police do their jobs day to day in our communities, that is what power this commission is going to have. And the district councils have a crucial gatekeeping function in making sure the right people with um, values that are community centered are selected to serve on that committee or commission. And, and also once those people are selected, that they have constant communication from the district council members who are gonna be the eyes and ears on the ground of those 
uh, of the policies that the commission is trying to enact or, or is studying. Further, I think the district councils just are gonna play a very important advocacy role of lifting up various community groups, ideas within the district, um, bringing together both police officers and community groups and just individuals who are uh, want to see a safer community in our district. And that advocacy role is one that we all, uh, Jenny Morelio and I take very seriously. Uh, so now I'll go with everyone's favorite question. Heads up to all the candidates backstage. I think I'll just be asking everyone this. What does community safety mean to you? For sure. And, you know, I, I don't mean to sound like a broken record with my co-candidates, Jenny and Marilio, but I mean, for me, what I love about this position is the opportunity to really put safety at the front of it. And safety can mean so much more than what we've traditionally been taught is only policing. Like policing is sort of the only tool that um, is thought of in the public conversation when we think about making sure that our communities are safe. And I'm so excited uh, to elevate and to advocate for other solutions, other tools that we can use to make our communities safer. For instance, just the, the mental health crisis response that you've heard a couple of times already. Um, you know, the 19th district has the second highest number of mental health, nonviolent mental health crisis calls in the city. That's why there's been a pilot program for more than a year in uh, the 19th district to have a program that will respond to nonviolent mental health calls with a mental health clinician, a mental health trained police officer, and a paramedic. Um, but that's still a really limited program. And I think that we can do a lot to enhance it and um, to do other models. Uh, that program that's currently running only runs from uh, daytime working hours during the middle of the week. So we could really expand it. And other organizations like Thresholds have their own 24 seven mobile crisis response teams that are responding to these kind of calls already and making the community safer in doing it. Uh, and all of this is I think bringing together a lot more community groups, a lot more input into what safety means and, um, and trying to welcome all voices in that conversation. Great, thank you. Um, so of those primary functions of the district council, the chair, the community connection and uh, nomination for the citywide commission, what do you most gravitate towards? Personally, the, the nominating commission is one that is really important to me because and it goes back to the idea of this whole law, which is that um, there is going to be some serious policy making authority that the Community Commission for Public Safety has. Um, I was disappointed that it took so long to name an interim commission. They were named about eight months after they were supposed to be in August of, uh, of this year. But they're off to a really good start. And I really want to make sure that the Community Commission has strong nominees, um, who have community-centered values um, that are selected to serve on that commission. And it's also going to be, a, it's gonna be uh, an interesting and important process to work with district council representatives from the other 21 districts across the city. And that's something that I would find, um, to, I would really like to be a strong voice for the 19th district and the values that we're running for on that nominating commission. Hi, thank you. One thing that's interesting about this being an entirely new role is that you have to educate voters not just about yourself, but also what police district councils even are. So, uh, Daniel, can you pull up that last question from Melissa? Uh, we're going to have you educate us a little bit more about uh, how the nomination process would work. So the, is this the nomination for uh, uh, commissioners? Yeah, so is the vote for the commission, yeah, weighted or one vote, one commissioner? Or how how does it work? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I don't actually, I need to go back to the actual statute to see the precise rules. My understanding is there's one, um, one district council member from each of the 22 police districts. They form a 22 member um, nominating committee and they will then nominate uh, two individuals to fill each one slot on the on the citywide commission. There's seven citywide commissioners. There are different qualifications that each have to have and certain slots to fill. For instance, I believe two, there are two need to be from the north side, two from the south side, two from the west side. Some have to be youth members. Some have to have certain experience like working in civil rights law or in advocacy. Um, and so, I don't believe it's weighted otherwise, but those are sort of the slots you have to fill. And um, the mayor then has the authority to either, um, you know, select from those that the district council nominating committee nominated 
or can reject those nominees and it goes back to the district councils. But again, the district councils play a really important gatekeeping function because no one can serve on that commission unless they've been nominated by the district councils. So in terms of gatekeeping, would there be any absolutely essential things you would look at for nomination to the commission? I mean, I, I don't think I have any litmus test in mind. You know, we're looking for people who come to this uh, with a genuine desire to, I think, breathe life into the goals that animated this law to begin with. You know, this law is the, um, it, it, it's the result of years of activism to make the police department more accountable to the community's needs. And that came from years of the community really being left out of a lot of those decisions and a lot of really terrible things happening um, at the hands of you know, certain parts of the police department. Now, I think that you know, people who come to this job wanting to take it really seriously, who have some expertise in their, in their subject matter um, and who understand how to research policy, understand legal frameworks, uh, understand how to work with people who might not always agree with them, which is also something that I and my co-candidates take really seriously. All of those are things that I'd like to consider in, in naming people to the commission. Great, thank you. And you have a minute to close. Thanks so much. And again, thanks to NDFA for this opportunity. Um, I just want to underscore how important I think this position is. Every single district council member is going to be elected for the very first time in this election to four-year terms. Um, the people who are elected are really going to, I think, shape in fundamental ways whether this new institution succeeds or fails. And I'm so excited to be running alongside Jenny and Marilio because we've formed a very strong team. We've engaged, as you've heard already, more than 100 volunteers in our campaign. Uh, that's the kind of uh, inclusive uh, administration we'd like to run as district council members. And we don't think we've got a moment to lose when this new institution uh, starts for the first time after inauguration day and we're ready from day one. Great, thank you so much, Sam. Really appreciate your time. Thank you, Becky, appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have Demarik Palachuk or Demi. Hi, Demi. Hi, Becky, how are you? I'm good, how are you? Uh, I'm good, so thank you. you have two minutes for an opening. All right, thank you. Um, yeah, I wanna say thank you again, Becky, and also um, NDFA for having us and welcoming us as, as you guys always do. Um, so hi, everyone, my name is Dimmering Palachuk. I live in Uptown. I've been in the district for about 10 years now. Uh, I started my public servant career about 13 years ago when I re-enlisted in the Air Force. Uh, I was young and I came from a very low income family and I knew I needed to pay for my education somehow and I wanted to you know, learn about the world and help my community at the same time. Um, unfortunately, my first enlistment, I became a victim of sexual assault. Um, unfortunately, as a lot of military women do, or all members. Um, and from there, when I gained the courage to finally come forward and start the legal process, uh, they ended my contract early. And however, my the person guilty, um, they actually fast-tracked him to help him on the police force. Um, and when I left, I just felt that my service there was not over. So I actually re-enlisted in Chicago um, in the National Guard. Uh, and I also started volunteering and speaking with a lot of nonprofits, um, people of victims of crime or sexual assault. Um, and since then, I've become the liaison for military policing and equal opportunity in the military. Uh, because of my position, I was actually activated to the uh, insurrections in DC. Uh, and so I was able to aid in that and police on both sides from that side um, and make sure everyone was treated fairly and equally. Um, when I returned, um, I realized actually when I was there that all my volunteering was as amazing as it is. Um, in order to protect people and truly protect people, we have to start changing laws. Um, so I became heavily like um, active in my community, uh, more on the political side almost. I became part of the 46 Ward um, Dems. I was part of the Illinois Veterans for Change, which is a veterans group who fights for uh, veterans to get like homeless veterans for them to have um, you know, dental care, because a lot of VAs, they don't get any care right now. Um, so we would plan donations, drives, we'd help um, the entire 46 Ward with uh, book bag drives, we welcome refugees for dinner. Um, and I just love working with the community. Um, and through that, and through my studies of getting stats for the community, um, I was actually able to work with Pope Francis and go through a school that he has. Uh, he has a political school, it's called Fratelli Tutti. And it's a global school of like young people who want to change laws from within, but about keeping your heart in mind the entire time. 
Um, so I was able to work in other countries and see how they did it, like Switzerland and Sweden, basically ended crime, addiction, and homelessness. And how easy, it's not easy, right? It takes a lot, but how it is doable to do in our own homeland. Um, so yeah, I was a part of a lot of the district council forming meetings. I live in Wilson and Sheridan. So, you know, over summers so, we've had- so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cut you off there. <laughs> We're at time for the opening. Um, so why don't you talk a little bit more about what made you interested in running for district council specifically? Yeah, absolutely. So as I said, I live on Wilson and Sheridan. Um, I'm sure if you know and you live in the district, uh, during the summers, it gets a little scary. A lot of my neighbors are scared to go outside. You know, last year we had four deaths right on my block. Uh, it's hard to see my neighbors running to their cars inside, like, this is where we live, this is our leisure, this is our home, this is where we work, uh, and we love our community. So there's something that we can do about it. And, um, you know, with my background, I feel like I'm able to advocate for both sides and we can have a transparent conversation. And, you know, as there is tension on both sides, you know, the community feels they cannot trust the police and the police, you know, we kind of feel that they don't care sometimes. We need to start those building blocks and have a good conversation and start from there. So I was really interested to see, um, you know, what both sides thought. And I loved working with the community and just getting out there and hearing from everybody. About what you mean when you say advocate for both sides. Oh, I'm sorry, what'd you say? Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean when you say that uh, you'd want to advocate for both sides? Yeah, for sure. And let me go back with that. So I've been to a lot of um, coffees with the commander and I work, um, I volunteer with Thresholds or Chicago Cred, and they are not coming forward to come to meetings with the, um, with Chicago Cred. Uh, we have a lot of mental health needs in this district, uh, especially Uptown. Uptown used to be the biggest per capita in America um, mental health facilities, and unfortunately we don't have those anymore. So what's happening to those people? We're not really taking care of them. Um, and when you bring those up to the 19th district, they're not really there, they're not really helpful. Um, you know, there was a break in a carjacking the other day and they said, this is not our job. So at that point, we need someone to go up to them and start a conversation. Well, we need to know what your job is. We need to know the job description. So just having these difficult conversations on both sides, um, you know, a lot of community members are scared and no one's standing up for them. Yeah, thank you. Um, so Daniel, can you pop up the comment from Erky? Because I think I'm sorry if I, I'm not sure if I said your your name right or not, um, but um, I, I think this is a really good point. And I wonder, uh, Demi, keeping this in mind, how would you plan to facilitate communication between community members and police? And really, how would you how would you facilitate police seeing themselves on the same side as the community? Yeah. So actually, um, several. I'm still in National Guard now, and several of my soldiers actually uh, will come to me and tell me things they hear um, or are told in like guard mob briefings or in their training. Um, and it's a little disturbing to me when they tell me things like right now, I think they're being told not to come to calls for 15 to 20 minutes. Um, that needs to be brought up. That needs to be talked about. And that needs to be addressed um, because it's not. And, you know, if I didn't have that relationship with my soldiers, like how would we know that? Because obviously that's not going to be on the record and no one's going to talk about it. Um, so what does community safety mean to you? Um, community safety to me, it means everybody feels safe, obviously. Like I said, we all work here. We live here. Um, we spend our leisure time here. Uh, we love our community. So making sure everyone feels safe. Um, you know, I, I know you spoke earlier about like which community groups and we really need to advocate for, you know, all people of color and of course, the LGBTQ plus community. Um, you know, they're getting hit hard right now with a lot of violence and we need to stand up for them. Great, thank you. Now, with the large size of the 19th district and the diversity, uh, how does that affect your approach to representing the 19th district? Yeah, I actually appreciate that the district councils, um, they do implement three people or yeah, three seats. Um, but basically, I mean, sitting down and having conversations. As district council says, you have one monthly meeting. I actually don't agree with that. I think that we need to have many more meetings with very diverse um, groups of people um, and make sure that everyone is heard because, you know, um, a lot of the meetings that are, are had, they're on a Monday at 10 a.m. Like if, if you're a single mother or father, how are you supposed to make it there? And how are you supposed to feel heard? You're not going to, or they're not online. If you don't have access to the internet, how are you supposed to join? 
but you deserve to be heard. So we want to go out there and hear you. Um, so other than timing and having meetings online, um, what other strategies would you use to make sure that community residents are heard and feel heard? Yeah, so I actually want to implement about, um, it's like a six structure advocacy for, uh, it's against combating, or it's combating acute violence. So essentially, I want to have more street outreach, uh, group violence intervention strategies, and like more mental health and therapeutic interventions. Um, also with the policing, I would like to go over their training. Um, as I said before, you know, there's different elements to their training from what they hear in the academy or learn in the academy to um, annual training, which they actually are not going to right now. Um, and use of force. I think use of force needs to definitely, uh, we need to implement a data research on that as we have a lot of data um, and we haven't really done anything with it. Um, they're kind of hiding the stats, um, but also doing more pulse checks with the community members. Like as we are implementing these things, getting feedback and using that and to pivot from there. Thank you. Uh, so of the different functions of the district council, the, the chairperson, the nomination of the community commission and really being the conduit to community, uh, what most appeals to you and how would you carry that out? Um, yeah, so as I said, I'd like to um, have more mental health and support outreach workers. I love hearing from the community. I love working with the community. Um, it's so diverse and everyone is actually, as a creative person, hearing from my community and how diverse and what they feel, um, listening to everyone is really important to me. And I just love to get to know everyone's stories in my, in my community. Everyone has a story. Um, everyone feels a certain way and to understand how they feel is really important to me and impactful. Great, thank you so much, Demi. And one minute to close. Yeah, so um, again, thank you guys so much for letting me be here um, and inviting us and having this forum, it's amazing. Um, and I feel um, in order for district council to be successful, we have to take a deep dive into the issues that we know about um, and find the other issues that we may not hear. We need to have very transparent conversations um, You know, over public safety, implementing our street outreach, group violence prevention, much more mental health initiatives uh, and, you know, afterwards therapy um, and just helping our community. So I feel with my military experience and being as progressive as I am, uh, I feel I am a good advocate for our people to be able to know what laws and rules we need to implement in order to make a safe community and move everyone forward. Great. Thank you so much, Demi. Really appreciate you joining us. And next up is Julie Caviar. Hi, good evening. Thanks, Becky, for having me. Thank you. And you have two minutes to introduce yourself. My name is Julie Caviar. I am a social justice champion with a diverse background, policy knowledge, and a passion for doing the work. I believe that everyone deserves to feel and be safe in their communities and to be treated with equal dignity and respect. I am dedicated to making inclusive change and want to fight for, every, for a resilient future for everyone. My motto is Caviar Cares, because together we can create a collaborative, accountable, responsible, and equitable system of safety. My family roots instilled the importance of giving back and building up my community. My parents and grandparents all worked in schools. My mother is a Caribbean immigrant who worked tirelessly to ensure a better life for her children. And my grandfather was a Jewish World War II veteran who enlisted at age 17 and taught me the importance of fighting to repair the world. For the last decade, I worked in public safety, health, and social services policy. I was named a 2022 Jewish United Fund Chicago 36 Under 36 for my career catalyzing progressive reform. Most recently, as Chief of Staff for Cook County Commissioner Scott Britton, I expanded ballot language access, wrote the first suburban Cook County renters' rights legislation, and led the county sheriff's office adoption of the Illinois NAACP and Association of Police Chiefs' 10 shared principles to rebuild trust between the community and the police. It would be an honor to activate a 19th police district council that builds trust with residents, strengthens community safety, and shines a light on our public safety system. I'm so looking forward to your questions. Thank you. Thanks, Julie. Uh, so let's just start out with what does community safety mean to you? That's such a great question. It's been so wonderful to hear all of the candidates hear that. 
absolutely community safety is it needs to requires an expanded definition. It requires a mutual responsibility that we recognize that we all have a stake in safety. It requires addressing the root causes of crime and poverty it, and, and that we look at the whole person, what safety means physically, emotionally, economically, and then filling in those gaps. It requires broader investments in economic opportunity, removing social determinants of poverty and addressing those root causes beyond just the police department. Um, There's so many situations that require that are that require safety, but don't require a gun. And so this council will be taking a, a direct look at that and trying to find those solutions. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, what lessons have you learned from working in government that would inform your service in this role? Thank you for that question. Um, I worked in the mayor's office during a time of great reform from 2016 to 2019. I was in the room when the consent decree was being discussed, when this office was being created. I wrote the community policing advisory panel report. I wrote the first police reform report. And that's not to say that um, having that insider knowledge means that I am an insider. It means that I have the directed skills to talk and to see into that institution and know what means to be changed. Terrific, thank you. Um, so what approaches do you plan to use to facilitate communication between community members and police? Absolutely, well, to pull a metaphor way too far, um, it's not enough that everyone should have a seat at the table. We need to undrill that table from the floor and drag it all over the all over the district to make sure everyone can actually have access to that seat at the table. Having a CAPS meeting once a month at, you know, at 3 p.m. on a Tuesday isn't actually asking for community, community feedback. We need to have an all-in approach. It's meetings, it's polls, it's online, and it's creating anonymous systems that people feel safe um, reporting their issues to. It also requires that we have directed forums with community leaders and organizations, that we get not just people who run nonprofits, but also people that are being served by those nonprofits. And in some cases, it requires paying them because they deserve uh, to be compensated for their time. It also requires that we build in partnership and collaboration as part of the process. It's not enough that there's one CAPS officer or one LGBTQIA plus liaison. Every police officer needs to be part of those, of those conversations and we need to build that into their schedules. Are there any particular populations that you would prioritize when it comes to community voice? Absolutely. Those who are most impacted by the justice system must be the ones that we listen to and hear from the most. So often, of course, that includes um, BIPOC folks, people of color, Black and Indigenous folks. It also includes marginalized people from the LGBTQIA community. And it also involves people who have been living in poverty and people who have been incarcerated. Those most impacted by the justice system um, have the most to say and, and, and will necessarily require the most reforms. And frankly, when we know that when we are able to improve the lives of the most vulnerable, everybody's lives are improved. So given the size of the district and its diversity, um, how does that affect your approach to representing the community and uh, raising those voices? I think that the 19th district is so beautiful. We've got amazing Caribbean immigrant populations, wonderful, exuberant queer populations. And we also have brought families and, and white folks who've been living here and seen the gentrification happen around them. It is so important that we value every voice and that again, we go to there. The mountain has to go to the people. And so when we are engaging with people, we're having a listening ear, but also trying to figure out how those story, stories can turn into policy and that we make those changes. And I'm going to share a question from Marissa from the Facebook Live. Um, are there any personal experiences from your background that have influenced your point of view? Thank you so much for that question. Um, when I was 11, I tested into a program called Prep for Prep. The mission of the program was to create more leaders of color. Um, the way they did that was through education. And so I went from a public school 40 person class um, after double education, just to catch up for 14 months, just to catch up to where my private school peers were, um, placed in a, a situation where there's now 12 people in a class, I'm the only person of color, and now every extracurricular is at my disposal. There's personalized college uh, you know, mentorship. And seeing uh, immediately 
as an 11 year old, the inequity that the haves and the haves not, that access to opportunity is critical and life changing and life giving um, has really informed my worldview. And I want to be part of government and part of solutions that ensure that everyone has access to opportunity. So in a district that's so diverse um, in terms of opportunity and, and given the role of the police district council, how, how do you as a counselor build equity um, and maybe even define a little bit for the group what that means to you? Absolutely. Thank you for that question. Um, equity is has to be part and parcel of the process. Police must treat every person with equally equal dignity and respect and have to understand the diverse um, resident perspectives and in order to ensure equal access to justice. And so some of that work includes how do we think about and reverse, you know, um, different biases that they may have. One policy idea is to ensure every single 19th police district officer takes the implicit bias test and not to shame them, but to actually unshame folks, to let people know that everyone has implicit biases in them. And then how do we actively train and work against those instincts? Um, it's also having those critical community conversations between police officers and those that they serve so that they can build empathy and really understand the lived experiences. But it's also understanding from a data-driven point of view to report on what is the local use of forces incidents? Where are police vehicle stops happening? Where are the pedestrian stops happening? And overlaying them with demographic and crime data to really understand the policies and practices of the police department to make sure that policing is actually happening equitably for everyone. Thank you. And this will be the last question. So of the different roles, the chairperson, the nomination of the community commission and really being that conduit to community, uh, what function of the district council most appeals to you and how do you plan to carry it out? Not just because I didn't hear any of my fine colleagues share this. I do think the important role of the chair is one that I would um, be honored to take on. Every aspect of this is community, is community engagement. And I do hope that every person on their council would have a thought or idea about who to nominate. But I do think the chair has a unique role in the administrative functions of, of the position and ensuring that the actual project management pieces are being done day to day. How do you, following up on the data gathering, standing up a victim support services, how do you have restorative justice and making sure that that is happening in a process driven way so we can actually measure and see those results. I would be honored to take on that role. Great. Thank you so much. And now you have a minute to close. Thank you so much. At my core, I believe that society is measured by how we treat the most vulnerable among us and that government should work for the people. It is the government's responsibility to solve challenges, make services accessible, and ease pathways for everyone to thrive. Community safety must be a community-based solution. It is essential that we shine a light on our public safety system to ensure it is working as intended. The police have a social contract with the communities they serve and are sworn to protect. Police must treat every person with equal dignity and respect and take steps to better understand diverse resident perspectives. But we cannot police our way out of gang violence and crimes of poverty. We must support alternatives for immediate community safety and make long-term investments in addressing root causes of crime. As a member of the Police District Council, it would be my honor to build a more collaborative, accountable, responsible and equitable system of state community safety because I, Julie Caviar, care. Please visit J-U-L-I-E-K-A-V-I-A-R.com for more. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. We really appreciate you joining us this evening. Um, and so those were all five of our candidates from the 19th district. And now we are going to hear from one candidate from the 18th district. Um, there were actually, there are actually seven candidates who filed to run in the 18th district, but we're going to hear from one, Amy Cross, this evening. Um, the 18th district runs, it's bounded on the south and on the west by the river. Um, so it goes roughly from the river up to Fullerton uh, and roughly from uh, the lake on the east to the river on the west. Um, so just south of the 19th district that we've been talking about. And uh, Amy Cross, you are up. Hi, Amy. Hi. How are you? Good evening. Good. Uh, you have two minutes to introduce yourself. Great. Well, thank you so much for having me tonight. I am Amy Cross. I am a Chicago native. I was born in Uptown 
And I uh, went to high school in the district I currently live in, in the 18th, uh, Lincoln Park High School. I went to Ogden Elementary before that. Um, and so I spent a lot of my uh, youth living in the 18th district and I now am a resident um, and I care a lot about the community. I want to keep it healthy and thriving. It is uh, an area of the city that generates a lot of revenue. Um, we have uh, very concerned and smart uh, residents who care a lot about public safety um, and, and really think a lot about crime. Um, for me, my interest in becoming a district council member really stems from my passion for social justice. I uh, became very involved as a teenager in trying to improve uh, conditions in my high school. Uh, I was part of the class of students that had metal detectors. Uh, we were maybe the first class to have metal detectors in our, our high school. And, um, you know, I, I just became very acutely aware of criminalization of young people, especially people of color in the city, um, a city that, you know, is deeply segregated and, um, and I think we can still see a lot of that today and some of the implications of it. Um, so I've spent, uh, you know, from that time as a teenager uh, to now, I've, I've spent over a decade working directly in the criminal justice system, first as a public defender. Um, I then went on to work on policy reform, uh, working hands on with police departments around the country uh, to prevent gun violence and serious gang violence. Uh, I have worked with probation departments uh, in some of the largest counties um, in the United States. I have, uh, I currently work on a prison reform initiative, and uh, I'm I'm very close to uh, justice reform policy. Uh, I keep myself informed, um, and I really just want to see uh, a, you know, I, I would like my neighbors to um, have an understanding of the justice system and how it works. Um, I also would like us to, uh, you know, acknowledge that um, we can have safety and we can have justice at the same time um, and that the two actually uh, depend on each other um, and, and there are ways to do uh, those things. Great, thank you. Um, are there any particular lessons learned from your work at the national level that you'd like to bring to the role of district council? Absolutely. Uh, what I've learned is that number one, uh, collaboration is key. Uh, you know, public safety is an ecosystem and is not just police uh, and policing. Um, and, you know, it, it starts at the community level and it, it you know, transfer, tr uh, it's transmitted across our entire system, you know, from the courts to um, to uh, our jails, um, our local jails, our prisons, um, everything that comes after that, supportive housing for people returning from incarceration, um, and then everything before that. Um, I also, I failed to mention that I used to be a, a high school teacher is, is how I got my start. Um, and so, and a youth organizer before that, I'm just going in all chronological directions here. Um, but what I've learned is that, you know, you can implement community-based solutions. You can implement, you know, many um, supports in the community that really help prevent crime. Um, you know, we have to focus on crime prevention and not just crime response. Uh, and, um, and really, you know, safety is not about focusing on crime. When we focus on wellness and the well-being of, uh, of people in any jurisdiction, um, you know, that's that's how you get to safety. Um, but it also requires setting some goals. I mean, when it comes down to it, you know, problem solving uh, in our public, uh, you know, service sector is really just like in any kind of business. You know, you need effective management, you need strong leadership champions, um, and collaboration really is key. Um, in your introduction, you mentioned that you went to Ogden. Um, have you followed the, the story of, of Ogden and, and Jenner? And do you have reflections um, from that that are applicable? Um, I just, I have to tell you that I, I think your video may have paused in the beginning. So I only heard 
Ogden and what you said after that. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, so in your introduction, you mentioned that you're an alum of Ogden Elementary. So have you followed the story of the Ogden gender merger? And do you have any kind of reflections that uh, from that that might be applicable to district council? I think especially in the 18th district. Um, you know, I actually, I was not living in Chicago at the time. Um, and so I, I can't, speak that well to it. My understanding is that the two schools merged. My reaction to it when I heard that was, um, you know, if it had to do with sharing resources, um, you know, across maybe a well-resourced school and one that was less so, um, I think that's a great thing. Uh, if it increased, you know, integration in the school racially, uh, economically, I think that's a great thing. Um, but that's really all I can say to that because unfortunately I haven't followed that issue that closely. That's completely fine. You're running for police district council, not school board. Um, so what does community safety mean to you? What does community safety mean to you? Okay, I'm gonna just repeat what I think you asked me, which is what does community safety mean to me? Uh, thank you. Yeah, community safety means to me that everybody has an opportunity to thrive. Um, and, and, you know, I, I mean that probably with the most sincerity um, I can even muster. It's uh, when you start from that question, um, you know, and that and that's not just also about looking solely at what is in front of your face. Um, and by that I mean, you know, when I think about the 18th district, we have um, a lot of uh, we have a lot of wonderful resources in our area. We have very, you know, well-educated people who live in this district. Um, but what we need to do is be mindful of how we interact with the rest of the city as well. So I just wanted to bring that point up. Um, and I think it's about trying to ensure that, um, you know, we're, we're understanding what is uh, causing us to feel unsafe. Um, you know, we have to listen to each other. We have to have conversations and try to understand um, how we can get to solutions um, without thinking about things as a zero sum game. Um, there actually can be safety for all people. And uh, I, I think that that's an important premise to start from. Um. And I know you're having some audio issues, so this is in the chat also, but uh, the next question is, are there any particular organizations or populations that you'd plan to prioritize when it comes to community voice? Um, you know, I think I, I really, I, we, we have residents in the 18th district who are lower income and I think are policed differently than uh, the majority of uh, the district and this was something I was able to learn in a lot of my conversations and collecting signatures as well. Um, so I would certainly want to prioritize the voice of, um, you know, residents of color in the 18th district um, and, uh, you know, folks who have had challenges with policing, um, you know, maybe low response, maybe uh, heavy handed response to um, or interactions uh, or low response to issues that they've been bringing up. Um, one thing that uh, a lot of folks in in our area are concerned about: we have a lot of businesses and business owners, and um, you know, I think that their voices need to be heard as well, um, because there is a concern about um, you know there is a concern about I think low uh, or poor police response times, and I think that really should allow us to get into a conversation about um, how we can look at resource allocation and try to understand you know, how we can improve that. Um, if, if we have a smaller number of officers who you know, are unable to, um, to respond to some of the uh, incidents or needs um, in you know, areas that are highly um, uh, popular with, you know, people who live outside of our district. In other words, you know, we bring in a lot of tourists, we bring in a lot of people who go out to nightclubs, um, we bring in people who are visiting all of our cultural institutions. Um, then we need to think about how we can, you know, more effectively use resources. Um, so I think that everybody needs to be at the table, but that, you know, that is, it, it, we can't solely focus on the interests of um, business. 
Great. Thank you. Uh, thanks so much for joining us, Amy. And now one minute to close. One minute. I for think your we, I might be. Okay. Thank you. And I'm sorry for the connection issue. I, I, I'm in a hotel room in uh, New York and doing my best over here. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I, I would just like to, you know, reiterate that, um, the, the reason that I want to be on the district council is because I think that I have a strong understanding of criminal justice, uh, uh, policy procedures. Um, I understand the challenges that police officers face in trying to, um, combat serious crime, the pressures that they're under. Um, I also understand that you know we need to we need to have accountability and what accountability looks like is not punishment um, it's about you know information transparency really looking at how we can uh, generate some solutions um, that can make us have a more effective police department and really just a more robust uh, public safety um, ecosystem that's participatory um, and that doesn't just allow the most privileged and vocal uh, voices to um, set the agenda. So, you know, I'm passionate about that. This is what I do for a living. Um, it's what I've committed my life to. And the reason I uh, threw my name into the ring here is because I would like to lend that expertise and just that experience um, to help us generate solutions, you know, across the city. Um, I really believe in, uh, in participatory uh, democracy and um, I do believe we can make policing more democratic, and I believe that I'm the person who can serve as a really good liaison to help break some of those policies down so that we are talking about um, facts and not just uh, ideas. Great. Thank, thank you, you so, so much, much for joining us tonight, Amy. Um, and I think you did a, a great job of trying to uh, be flexible with some of our technical difficulties here. I guess real world illustration of how we have to be flexible to ensure people's voices are heard. So thank you so much. Thank you. <laughs> um, and so now we are going to go over to the 25th district, uh, which is farther to the west. Um, it goes from Central Park all the way west uh, to the city limits and from Division up to Belmont. Um, there are five candidates who filed to run in the 25th district, and we are going to hear from two of them this evening. Um, so we'll start with uh, Saul Ariano. Hi, thank you so Hi, much for having Paul. me. How thanks, are you? For ha thanks for joining us. Uh, and you have two minutes to introduce yourself. Hi, nice to meet everyone. Uh, it's an honor to be in your presence. It's an honor to be considered uh, to be endorsed. My name is Saul Arellano. You know, um, I have a vast background in organizing and doing political work at such a young age. I have learned, you know, I have done a lot of work with immigration, also with fighting against racism, sexism, homophobia. Um, you know, through the pandemic, we know that there was a lot of um, there was a lot of different social injustices that came about and that were amplified due to all these different uh, lack of resources. And so we took an initiative with different organizations like Healthy Hood Chicago, Centro Sin Fronteras, and different other organizations to find and give access uh, to our communities to different things that they didn't have in that moment, which was you know resources to food, COVID testing, COVID vaccines, and that was the work essentially that we did during the pandemic and also push different programs like the five plus one equals 20 program that informed our communities, our most marginalized communities about the five diseases that attacked our communities. And so those were also the five diseases that made you more ill from, um, from COVID. And so we wanted to give access to people to inhalers, give access to people to, um, to different uh, programs if they have asthma, if they have diabetes, high blood pressure, and so that was kind of the work that we that we pushed forward, as well as I did a lot of work with a housing organization called uh, LSNA, where we were able to get about one hundred and twenty million dollars uh, that was not supposed to be given to housing. And we were able through our work of, you know, lobbying and talking to the different legislators like Will Gazzardi, Delia Ramirez and Cristina Basione Sayas, we were able to get one hundred and twenty million dollars allocated to housing, you know, here at 
in Illinois, which was such a great victory. And so as well now, you know, there's currently a Belmont Triangle, the Belmont Triangle here, in, um, which is close to the 25th district. And what they're trying to do there is to build more affordable housing and to build, you know, a community center and to build a library so we can have more spaces for our community and more spaces for the youth. And so I will soon graduate uh, with a bachelor's degree in justice studies and with a minor in uh, political science and sociology. And, you know, my focus of study has been social injustices that have been occurring within uh, social institutions such as racism, classism, homophobia, and other forms of oppression. And because I have dived in deep to these different forms of, of oppression and the real consequences it has caused marginalized communities, that's why I decided uh, to run for this position of district council for the 25th police district. And I intend to serve the community and the immense need for community investment. And we must invest in life-changing social services and offer well-funded social institutions. Great, thank you. Um, how has your own personal experience prepared you to serve on police district council? It has prepared me because um, I've also, as I mentioned, I worked for the Boys and Girls Club. I worked with a lot of youth and I also was, you know, firsthand experience uh, the different needs that they had. You know, there was many occasions where there was a lot of these, a lot of youth, a lot of our children that were, you know, that were victims of police crimes, that were victims of violence. And so we had to create these different peer circles, these different circles in which we, you know, we would mentor these uh, these children and we would mentor them into, you know, to get, giving them access to education, to giving them access to mentorship. And so these experiences of having, you know, having these one-on-one -on -one conversations with the youth and knowing how brilliant and amazing these children were and how much capability of, of going even further. And so, you know, so that is what really encouraged me when I entered um, my college years it's what really pushed me to really fight for social injustices and really focus on how I could contribute to um, to fighting for them and to also, you know, finding, uh, you know, the interconnectedness of all these different systems of oppression and how could we, you know, how could I be a servant, a public servant for my community and for those children and also for the rest of the 25th police district, which is who I plan and intend to represent. And so those different experiences of working in all these different organizations and having these deep rooted conversations with the community is what I feel that gives me, um, that gives me the, the courage to continue and do this work. And the reason why is because I am, I am rooted in the community and because I, I believe that I am part of the community and I will listen to every single one of them, you know, may it be the senora, the lady at the, at the tamales stand, may it be whoever is in the laundromat to every single person in the corner of, of the 25th police district is who I plan and intend to represent. And so, you know, so I'm, I'm rooted in, in being a public servant and being and just amplifying the voices of the community. I don't plan to be in this position just to, to get a shiny title, but I do this because I truly love my community and I truly want to bring more investment. And because I know that when we truly invest into our communities, when we truly invest in our youth, they they will do such amazing great things and so that is kind of where where i am where my experiences and where everything lines up and so i feel like i am also going to listen to the community and where i i am just here to learn and to also bring up their their voices and amplify them and allow them to also be leaders and to also be the next leaders that come up because you know that's what we do for our communities. We want to amplify them and, and make them strong. Thank you. Um, what approaches do you plan to use to facilitate communication between community members and the police? Yeah, so one of our one of the biggest the biggest things that we we're pushing for is participatory democracy. And it's pretty much essentially, you know, allowing for the communities to be at the table and to actually not just be part of the table, but also be on the menu. And so they can also be able to be really heard and to be really listened to, to all of their needs. And so, you know, it doesn't matter to me where it is that the conversations must must be, if it has to be at the house of, of La Senora at whatever time she's, she's ready, you know, if we gotta keep knocking on doors, if we gotta keep going house to house and talking to them, that is what we'll do because we want to make sure that we're having that communication with the people and that we're also bringing 
these voices to the police. And so they understand what it is that the real needs are in our communities. And so what we plan to do is we plan to allow for the community to have a space where they can talk, where they can express themselves and where they can truly, truly feel like they are being listened to. Because I think for so many years they've been, um, their voices have been neglected. And so that is what, you know, what our position, what my position as a, as a district council will be, is we'll be, you know, amplifying those voices and really, really advocating for the communities and really advocating for what their needs are. And so that is kind of what we intend to bring and to, to show and to bring to the police department and to, and to the police is like, these are the needs of our communities and how can we work on this together? Because, you know, for so long, their voices have been neglected. And so now it's time that we can find that, you know, that time to give them and to listen to them for real now. Great. And what does community safety mean to you? What community community safety looks like and what a safe community looks like is is a place that works to prevent situations and issues from escalating. For starters, you know, we need to make sure that we're funding services for youth, you know, funding services for our community members, having recreational spaces, you know, having mental health services and community events that allow for neighbor participation. And within that, we can create an emphasis on protecting underserved youth, underserved uh, black and brown people and, you know, different other marginalized groups. And this will, you know, this will also help to significantly, significantly lower suicide rates, you know, between youth. And also it will also increase academic records and reduce their chances of homeless homelessness and also ending up in the prison system. And so what this means, it means creating a support system rather than a punitive system which is something that what we've had, you know, we want to step away, stem away from that um, hard on crime kind of uh, way that we do. And what we want is we want to, you know, we want to see a community that is given, that is encouraged to grow. And we want, and we only see a community flourish when all of its members are given that fair opportunity, that equal shot uh, to grow. And so that is what we plan to do. Thank you. And now you have a minute to close. Sorry, I couldn't hear you. You have a minute to close. Oh, sorry. Um, So yeah, thank you so much for giving me the opportunity. You know, um, I am running because I find it fundamentally important that our youth have safe spaces, no matter their race, gender, sexual orientation, or class. And it's time to create institutions that will allow them to have a place to grow and have an abundance of mentorship and guidance. We need an area where the community as a whole feels supported and listened to. And I want to tell you that I am dedicated to creating a platform where the people are at the forefront of decision-making that impacts their safety. I will fight to establish new restorative justice practices to bring funds to education, youth programs, housing, and as well as funding mental health, because now it is time to invest in our communities and allow their voices to be heard. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for joining us this evening. Appreciate your time. And next up is Edgar Esparza, our second candidate from the 25th district. (coughs) Hi, Uh, you have two minutes to introduce yourself. Uh, Hello, Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, My name is uh, Edgar Edgar Esparza. I'm running for the 25th Police District Council. Uh, For the same three reasons I ran for older person in Chicago four years ago at the age of 22, public safety, reform, and constituent inclusion. These issues go hand in hand. We can't have public safety without reform, and we certainly can't fix a system without input from those who live under such a system every day. I'm a lifelong resident of Belmont Cragen, uh, which is one of the several communities within the 25th Police District. I think it's crucial that these councils are filled by people who embody the diversity of its constituents and who can understand and relay those nuances to outsiders and to our officers. I've spent most of my life in academia as a student myself. I obtained my associate's degree in arts from Wilbur Wright College in 2017. Additionally, I received my Bachelor of Arts from Columbia University in New York City uh, two years ago in 2020. Uh, Currently, I I am enrolled at the University of Chicago seeking a Master of Liberal Arts, but I also 
am a first year elementary school teacher at a school in the 25th police district in Chicago, which further demonstrates my devotion to this community. Um, I think it's important that we, as some of the other candidates tonight have also hinted, uh, this new role is brand new and we need people in this role to make sure that the very first step we take is a positive one and not one that sends us backwards because many people have fought for this opportunity and I want to be a person who stands up for residents, for community members, for those who uh, ha should be heard but don't have voices. In many parts of the city, um, we don't have democracy. We don't have constituent voices being heard. We don't have uh, forums to even have us, to even give people the opportunity like this, which is so great tonight. And I'm uh, thankful for, um, for you hosting this, but we need more of this. We need more of these opportunities for residents, not just the people that are in power like myself. I am always going to be there looking out for the residents of my community. Great, thank you. Um, now you mentioned that you ran for alderman four years ago. Um, what made you decide to switch and run for police district council this year? Well, um, I was one of three that were cha uh, one of two people challenging an incumbent alderman, and we were running on the same. We were diff running practically on the same thing. We wanted change. We wanted inclusion. We wanted democracy. We wanted people to be uh, to be heard, to have a voice in their government. We wanted to make sure that in areas of government where, you know, public inclusion isn't always, you know, um, able to be made, that there's transparency on how decisions are made. And so I, um, this, this year in the 30th Ward, I'm a, still currently in the 30th Ward, even though they changed the maps. Uh, I'm supporting a person who ran alongside me to challenge the incumbent alderman last uh, four years ago, uh, Jessica Gutierrez, and I'm supporting her because we are aligned on the same issues about uh, democracy in our ward, uh, public inclusion, reform, public safety, all these things we're aligned with. And I think that's what we need in this position too. We need partners, not antagonizers like We've seen some people in some wards, maybe even at the citywide level. We need partners. We need their, We need people who understand that they're they're there for one per for one purpose: public service. Not to make a name for themselves. Not to, you know, go out for other offices. They're there to serve constituents. And in this position, in particular, it's three things again: public safety, reform, and accountability. Also falls in there. Thank you. That's helpful. Um, so I uh, noticed you mentioned kind of how your connection uh, to uh, Jessica Gutierrez has evolved. I'm interested, you said on your questionnaire and I saw on your website, you've been endorsed by Willie Wilson. Can you tell us a little bit more about that kind of alignment of views, how that came about? Uh, so four years ago when I ran for Alderman, he was uh, someone who I also got his endorsement. Uh, he endorsed me for Alderman. Um, he's also one of the reasons why I kind of uh, ran for Alderman at such a young age. Um, because uh, Even in 2015, I tried to run for Alderman at the age of 19 or so, uh, and I got knocked off the ballot because of I, I wasn't aware of all of the details of running for office. And four years later, I ran in 2019 at 22. And so Willie Wilson was one of the very, was practically one of the only people who, one of the public officials that endorsed me, himself being a, a candidate running for mayor at that time. And because I, I see myself running the same reason he ran, uh, and that's for helping people. I mean, he has a, he, he's many things, but uh, I think the the best word to characterize him is humanitarian. I mean, he's he's always been there for his community you know, decades before he became a candidate for any office. And I hope to live up to that same sort of public service uh, that Willie Wilson has. I mean, I live by a quote that he, um, that he's, uh, it's not, I mean, he's, he's not a, someone who people quote a lot, but I, I uh, listen a lot to what he says. And he says, you're not successful unless you're helping somebody else. And that's 
what drives me. I'm not successful unless I'm doing something for myself to help someone else. Great quote. Um, so I'll, I'm going to tweak a little bit the question I've been asking everyone else. Um, I'm interested in knowing what community safety means to you, but also you mentioned you're an elementary school teacher in the district. So what do you think your students would say that community safety means to them as well? Great question. And I was actually going to uh, form, formulate my answer according to that. Uh, I think that the greatest litmus test for if we have community safety can be found in our schools with the youth of our community. Uh, and while I'm slowly creeping out of that group at 26 years of age, uh, I'll, I'll still include myself when I say that we as young people have no filter. I mean, we'll be honest about our relationship with the police. Um, while as a teacher, I think that if the most vulnerable in our community, like children aren't safe when they play, when they walk and play in our neighborhoods, then none of us are. I think also that community safety means safe interactions with police officers, ensuring they are knowledgeable and respectful of civil rights and civil liberties. So as this new role as a teacher, I'm, I'm getting even more in, in deep into things of the, you know, family life. I mean, myself, I'm a family, I, I come from a Hispanic family and so two hardworking mother and father, but I'm listening from pr perspectives of students themselves. I teach fifth grade from students who, you know, have come here who have English as a second language, who are coming from a single family, um, single parent households. And so all of those nuances for myself, I'm taking those into account when I'm uh, hopefully put in charge of this role as representing this wide community because the nuances and the diversity of this community, of this district is so large. And I think myself being always be, having my roots here. I mean, I've I've gone outside of, for school and such, but I've always come back home here. I'll always put my roots here because that's who I am. And I think myself as a school teacher, I always have, um, even though I'm not a parent yet, I still see myself as a parent to these children. And I'll also see the, uh, the district's children the same way as my kids, you know, as my people, my residents that I am going to give a voice to, especially children, because at a young age, like fifth graders, they're not able to vote. They have very limited say, but, you know, I want to be that voice. And we have time for a short answer to one more question, and that's what approaches do you plan to use to facilitate communication between community members and police? So I think communicating uh, via our neighborhoods rather than wards or any kind of other political boundaries, uh, because those boundaries are usually cut cut through communities and they separate us. So I think it should be a responsibility for future council members to reach out and communicate with grassroots um, community organizations already in those communities, then completely building from something, something from the ground up. Um, I think there's a better facilitation of having a message and being able to communicate to many more people. Because again, I don't see myself as being you know, someone who's, um, you know, completely separated. I see myself as someone who is involved in the community. I want to work with people. I'm a partner, not someone, again, who's trying to make a name for himself. And of course, door knocking and shaking hands and meeting new people should never cease. It shouldn't just be a trend during election season. But we should also be cooperating with other public officials, federal, state, and city. We have to be voices for all residents to have a say in determination and determining the the direction of public safety, reform, and constituent inclusion. Great, and one minute for your closing. Uh, okay, so um, I want to thank the Northside Democracy for America for hosting this forum and giving me an opportunity to reach uh, to many of my hopefully future constituents. Um, tickets shouldn't be our sole means of interaction with police officers. Officers, I believe, should be like any other public official, visible. The only difference is frequency. We shouldn't only see our policemen and women keeping our streets safe, but they should all be, also be seen inside our schools and on public transit. I promise to be a friendly partner, attentive listener, and vocal communicator for residents of the 25th Police District. 
And I thank everyone for showing up here and for giving me the time and opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you much, so much for joining us, Edgar. Really appreciate it. And now we have one final district and one final candidate to hear from. We're going to go over to the 14th district, um, which goes from division up to Belmont and goes from the river west to Central Park. Um, there are actually only two candidates who filed to run in this district um, because each district will elect three members of the district council. It essentially means that um, this race is uncontested, um, but we still think it's really important that everyone get a chance to hear from uh, the candidate uh, in that district uh, who aligned with NDFA values, and that's David Orlikoff. Hi, um, my name is David Orlikoff. Uh, I'm a Chicago native and a grassroots organizer fighting for horizontal democracy and community control. Um, I was the defund CPD outreach lead for the 35th Ward, where we got over 2,500 petition signatures and 71 group endorsements to reduce CPD's budget by 75% and reinvest those solutions uh, in, you know, for our communities that provide the care that we need. Um, I didn't want to run until I found out that we didn't have enough uh, good candidates in the 14th district. Um, but, you know, I don't want to waste this opportunity that our community has because we're ready for a big positive change. So fairness and justice have always been very important to me. But the more that I learned about and experienced our so-called justice system firsthand, uh, the less fair it ap appeared. I became very involved in organizing during college with Occupy Chicago, uh, marching against the banks that stole millions of families' homes and then got huge government giveaways. Well, the people suffered. Uh, I made connections with a lot of people and groups doing great work in the city, uh, including the Chicago Alliance Against Racist and Political Repression, uh, who've helped people like myself uh, to be trained in order to run for these positions. Uh, I also experienced a lot of violence, harassment, abuse of rights, targeted attacks, and organized lying uh, by the police. When the mayor put out her budget survey, 87% of Chicago voted to defund CPD by some amount. That might sound surprising given the ways defunding has been villainized, but Chicago spends the most per capita of any US or global city on police, almost half of our total budget. So it's not a question of bad apples, but of a system that uh, isn't working and allows for them to abuse their position. Police should not be above any law or the people in the communities they serve. There isn't a single person who should be trusted to use their power and authority to police themselves. And there isn't a single politician that you should trust who says that police are the solution to all of our problems. That's a lazy way to govern by taking payments from the rich while doing nothing for the community. Um, uh, am I at time? You're yeah, just about at time, that's perfect. Um, so why don't we start with the fact that, you know, this is technically an uncontested race, only two people filed. So how do you plan to get residents in your community more engaged in community safety and in police accountability? Uh, well, I, I touched a little bit on that. I, it, we are very engaged. Uh, however, you know, not necessarily in this process. Um, there, there was support certainly for the CPAC, the initial proposal um, for the Civilian Police Accountability Council that, you know, was put forward after, you know, working with um, a lot of black youth in Chicago that were tortured and uh, into false confessions and in prison for decades. You know, so for a long time, Carper has been pushing the, the Civilian Police Accountability Council that eventually was uh, sponsored by our alderman, Carlos Rosa, and then morphed into ultimately the ECPS. Uh, which has a lot of good things and, you know, some unexpected things. So I, I think that there uh, is not a, currently, you know, a huge amount of um, insight in this, except from, uh, again, from the UN35 and, uh, you know, people closer to Carlos. Um, they are very invested in uh, supporting this. But as far as the community, um, it's just a question of education and because the engagement on the underlying issues is very, very strong. And then... Uh David, if you don't know the answer to this, it's completely fine. But what happens with that third seat? Um, yeah, so I've, I've heard that there would be a nominating process uh, involving the elected people. So basically, um, anyone elected would uh, sub, uh, sort of yeah nominate the the unopposed or yeah the unfilled seat, uh, and that has to be you know confirmed through city council. 
Um, and then a question from Facebook. Uh, what buttons are you wearing? Uh, they can oh, see Espada no. and Jesse Fuentes, but who else? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so there's four districts in, you know, the span the 14th, and um, I was uh, lucky enough to be endorsed by UN35, and they gave me a ton of support, as well as, um, you know, Daniel Espada is uh, running for re-election, and I really hope he wins, um, and Jesse Fuentes is a challenger for the 26th district. Uh, I also have an anti-racist uh, button, and um, defund CPD, and the original CPAC. <laughs> Thanks for that question. Great, thank you. For anyone who's on, who's an NDFA member or people who are interested in getting more involved, NDFA does meet tomorrow evening. Uh, for voting members, we are going to be voting on endorsement of Carlos Rosa, I believe. And Jesse Fuentes is going to be speaking, I believe. And I think Joe will probably correct me in the chat if I'm wrong. And we've already endorsed Daniel Espada for re-election. So um, definitely some familiar names to the NDFA crowd. Um, so uh, what does community safety mean to you? Ah, oh, uh, one second. Um, yeah, the, the safest communities don't have the most police. I mean, we've had great answers on this. I'm just going to read something short. Um, they have the most resources, you know, so no matter what crime or issue you're looking at, policing is reactive. And the solution to the underlying problem is a social safety net that supports our community by uplifting everyone. You know, we want to not have horrible, violent crimes occurring and police can't wind back time. You know, even if in the best like TV show versions of police, they're not solving these problems, you know, that we want to have less of. If we spend half of our resources, it has to be in preventing crimes by giving people what they need, not in whatever it is that we're doing. <laughs> um, so a safe community is one where everyone is housed, fed, cared for physically and mentally, and is free from incarceration and has equal opportunity. Um, thank you. And what approaches do you plan to use to facilitate communication between community members and police? And I'm, I'm particularly interested, I mean, you're in a different spot as an unopposed candidate. You can maybe be a bit um, more strident in some of your positions, but I think you're the first person we've heard mention defunding. You know, you've, you mentioned um, experiencing violence at the hands of police. So given sort of some, uh, history there, uh, how does that affect your uh, facilitation of communication between community members and police? Certainly. Um, so, you know, it will be a council and um, I may look forward to <laughs> assistance from uh, council members and supporting some of the roles. But um, I mean, I, I, I will, you know, I, I do have fear of police in some regards, certainly. Uh, I think it will be beneficial to to have, you know, the official position to be an elected representative. Um, it won't be so much an individual capacity as, you know, representing the community. Um, so that will, you know, shield and protect and guide me. Um, but at the same time, I, I don't, I, I'm running for this because the meetings uh, prohibit police from attending. So, I, you know, I think that the really important thing is that the public is engaged on the issue of public safety, which is again, you know, half of our budget, that is a conversation that is, they've been completely divorced from. So we need more, we need to fully exercise and build up the muscle of the community, the public and the government body independent of policing, like, and intentionally so. That's something, you know, that um, Carper stuck to their, their guns on, that police could not run for these positions, et cetera. Uh, and that's probably the most important thing in the bill. So, you know, they do need to be worked with. I'm going to lean on my allies, you know, the, the groups like UN35, Northside Democracy for America, the aldermen, the people who are more used to working with the police, I guess. And I'm going to work more with the community. Um, so I'm going to end with a question from uh, Joe that I think is a, an interesting question and might speak to kind of what the future of this whole structure looks like and, and how well it um, gets implemented. Like, it, do you think there's something about your district that kept people from stepping up to run? Or is it that yeah. the district's like, oh, we, we got this. We're, we don't need to run because everything's perfect. Um, I, I doubt it's the latter. <laughs> I mean, it's probably, uh, you know, everything is a random mix of stuff. Um, so uh, to some degree, I know that there were really strong candidates 
considering to some degree, you know, it's, it's, um, it's not, you know, it's a great position for, uh, for young organizers. Uh, you know, I love the, the candidates that we've heard. Um, but I guess a, a little bit less so maybe for some older, um, folks with other responsibilities, um, where, you know, it's not a full-time position. It doesn't replace anything else. It's an additional sort of task. Um, and so for various reasons, a couple strong candidates weren't able to fully commit. Um, but in addition to that, I do think that defund CPD is sort of like, was the unique factor in this area specifically. And, you know, they made the intentional decision not to endorse any type of reforms, including uh, ECPS. And I respect that because the only way that you get any concessions from anyone like Lori Lightfoot, who hasn't kept her campaign promises, uh, you know, to reopen the mental health clinics, and you know now her only promise is like more cops again. Um, so in order to get any concessions like ECPS, you have to stake a position that's very strong and uh, you know principled and based in reality as well, um, but isn't based in someone's idea of pragmatism. You have to take the right position because it's the right position, and that's the only way that you're going to drag people kicking and screaming to where we need to get. Great, thank you. And one minute to close. Uh, oh. Um, so, <laughs> sorry, uh, this is, will be a little bit uh, unorganized, but some things that I support, some general sort of policies, um, you know, reopening the mental health clinics, uh, treatment, not trauma, which, you know, me, uh, means that we need to fund citywide mental health trained crisis response teams independent from police, um, you know, uh, and we also need to have not just crisis services, but Serve, yeah, like mental health clinics, but but other services as well, especially for um, violence intervention and prevention, including a lot of wraparound stuff like mentorship, uh, ex-gang members, um, you know, a lot of stuff for youth, uh, summer jobs, trainings, uh, education programs. Um, in addition, as far as police are concerned, you know, we need to end the racist unconstitutional gang database. We need to charge cops for filing false reports. That's something that I uh, am very um, opinionated about. I mean, I, we can't trust them to be a part of, you know, a, a function of the justice system if we're allowing them to be dishonest on a, a level that, you know, is um, uh, systemic. There's, there's systemic dishonesty. We have to be honest about that and we have to really um, take a hard stand. Great. Thank you so much for joining us tonight, David, especially since being in an uncontested race, you really didn't have to. Really appreciated hearing from you. And that is all of our candidates for this evening. Thank you so much to the nine candidates who took time to join us this evening. Um, I hope that a lot of you can join us on Thursday evening to hear from the far north side candidates. And I am going to turn it over to Joe to close us out. You're on mute. Of course I was. It was a, David was like, get me off, get me off, I get it. So anyway, thank you, Becky, uh, for doing a great job. Uh, Dan Lupner and 99 Perspectives behind the steel wheels getting this done. Uh, thank you, everyone that has been, that have been watching day one, our first of two uh, online forums for the, these North Side uh, positions. Um, Again, I, I'm kind of musing over David's comment about the fact that these are attracting a lot of younger candidates and a lot of younger organizers. That seems rather important and rather interesting as we roll on. Uh, so first of all, this will be available once we're done here on Facebook. So if you have friends in those districts that would like to watch these candidates, they are welcome to do so. We are talking to our friends at 99 Perspectives and hope that uh, these could also be rebroadcast re on CAN TV. We will know more, I believe, on Thursday. Uh, so yes, and so Thursday at 6.30 will be our second set of, uh, our second online forum for streaming. Uh, we also have our regular NDFA meeting tomorrow evening, uh, social hour at six, meeting starting at seven at Fireside Restaurant in the Edgewater neighborhood on Ravenswood. If you go to our uh, Facebook page, Northside Democracy for America, we will give you uh, more details. And again, uh, Daniel, if we could ask you to uh, run the link to the tip jar. Uh, we are able to do these special events because we have the funds to be able to do so. And so if anybody 
would like to give us a tip to allow us to keep doing these events. We are also hoping to set up a special mayoral uh, mayoral forum in January with a particular set of mayoral candidates that uh, would like to that we would like to see for NDFA. That would be great. And so, with all of that, again, thank you, Becky. Thank you, Daniel. Thank you to all of the candidates for these four districts. We will see you again online on Thursday at 6.30. And again, once this ends, you will be able to restream and get people involved in the, these candidates and these candidacies. They're super important. Thank you.